Okay, good morning. Um, so, today I'll cover, I'd like to cover two chapters, protection and security, um, how, how much we can go for, for those two topics. Um, and I'm going to go through the security fairly in a hand-waving fashion, mostly because it's, it's probably best covered in another class. I mean, I think you can go on for a few lectures to go through the security aspects of it. So I'll, I'll mostly talk about how these relate to operating systems and leave the general security after another class. Uh, the handouts are there, and if you want me to go over them, I can go over them. But in general, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk about what affects operating systems and leave the rest for another class. Um, Gabe? Um, I was wondering, would system administration be a good course to take to get more in depth with the security of the operating uh, No, you should probably take a security class. I think, I don't know but if it's, it's being offered it's next semester. It would be offered in the fall, maybe in the spring. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, okay. system administration would, would at best go through using security, not the uh, security aspects of it. So, the, the first topic is on, on pr protection, right? And protection affects uh, the uh, operating system a lot more. So, so far we kind of talked about all these, all these objects, all these you know, devices and all those things, um, and we never talked about how you would make sure different entities should have access to them, right? Uh, if, you have a, if you own the machine and it's all to yourself, you can imagine being able to access all the resources. But in a, in a real machine, you want certain things to have access to certain things and not, certain other things not to have certain other things, right? So that's the problem of, of uh, protection. You want to protect your resources from each other within the system and protect from outside. And security is one way of attacking some of these concerns, not precisely, right? Protection is more of an OS issue. Security is more of protecting some of your contents of the your data, your data integrity, and all, all those things, right? Um, so here, we are, all you're worried about is each object, each file, each resource you can think of is only accessed by certain people uh, in a, at a certain fashion. And the guiding principle here is principle of least um, privilege, right? So the idea here is, if you can specify all the privilege that each of them can have, meaning you know, read, write, modify, or, or what have you, for every object in the system, right? Then that will be ideally the best thing you would want, right? It's ideal because that's the possible uh, options you can have, but it's practically it is impractical to be able to specify everything, right? So if you have to go through your file system and say every file I have to annotate and say who should have access to, what, what they should have access to. Not just who, but also which program, right? So, so you may want to say your PowerPoint pro program should not have access to this text file. It should have this access text file and, and so on and so forth, right? If you want to do that for all the objects, then you can imagine it's going to be painful. I mean, most of your machines have, probably have hundreds of thousands of files and other resources. So the principle you use is principle of least privileges. So I assume that everyone has the barest minimum resources and I have to explicitly give you more resources, right? If I go with that principle, then I don't have to start off by annotating everything. Um, so that's the guiding principle throughout, the, um, throughout this, this functionality, right? So you, you want to make sure that you get the least amount of privileges. Anything more, you have to explicitly ask me, and I, as a user, may grant you. I, as operating system, may grant you, but otherwise, you don't get them, right? So we'll we'll see a little bit of what those are. So in, in a more formal terms, the protection are are considered the access rights, right? So if you assume each object, and if you take an object O1, O2, O3, or what have you, and give them you give them the access rights. And the rights here are read, write, execute, which sort of makes sense for files uh, and so on. But for other objects such as printer, it may mean print. So it, these are the functions that you can, uh, you can call on that particular um, object, right? And, and object can be anything. So we kind of vaguely, leave it vaguely. So it could be users, it could be um, printers, it could be files, it could be programs, and so on and so forth. And you define a notion of a, of a domain to make things uh, easy to understand. So you can assume all the files created by you are in your domain, in your user domain, and so on and so forth, and some of the domains may overlap, right? This is still at a high level, and we'll see what that translates to in a few, a few states. So think of it, thinking of it within the Unix file system, right? 
In terms of protection, it only has notion of two domains. One is the super user, which, which many of you did attain the super user privileges by using a sudo command, right? So whenever you do sudo a, a, a program, that program runs as root, right? But otherwise, there's only two users. There's, there's super user and everybody else. And everybody else is equally are equal for the most part, right? Everybody else can do anything else to everybody else. And super user can, has privilege over everybody else. So super user can do stuff that other users cannot do, but all the other users are the same. All the others, other users can equally destroy each other, which is they can't, right? They can't kill a process owned by somebody else. They, they, they don't have any more privileges than others. And the super user has all the uh, protection, right? And and as you can imagine, that's not exactly useful because that means only the administrator can do certain things. And two ways to get, get privileges is through uh, sudo command. Or in the file system, you can mark certain files as with a special bit, which says that if this file ever runs, run it as the user of the file, not as me. Right? So if I set, mark a program as set to ID, and if it's owned by root, then the program will run as root and not as me. Right? And that's how you, you do some privilege operations. Right? Can you think of a privilege operation that you have done other than sudo? Um, so privilege operation has to do something, has to change something in the system that you should not be allowed to change, right? Yeah. TCP dump requires privileges. Yeah. So, yeah, TC, t, um, a TCP dump is a... Is a Yes, TCP dump. So TCP is a program which is a packet sniffer, so it, it tells all the packets which are going through, right? Um, and you don't want it to be accessible to any, any user, right? Um, mostly because it's not only protecting your machine, it's protecting everybody else, right? So you may be sniffing for other packets. So um, TCP dump either has to be run as root, or you can set the privileges so that any user can run it by elevating themselves, right? Um, right. Do you have another example? Uh, yeah. Um, any of the installation protocols like AppGet or Yum. Mm -hmm. If you want to install anything on your on your on your system directory, right, and uh, including the um, in Linux you have you know Apt and Yum and all those things, and in Windows you have certain things, and um, in, in Mac, you have certain things, right? So if you want to install a package, which has to be installed for everyone, you know, in, in your slash user or slash applications or whatever, right? You need privileges, right? So it may either fail because you don't have privileges, or it may ask you, right? Within within the Mac OS, it'll ask you, you're trying to access something on the system, system directories, right? You're trying to modify some applications which could be used by other people, right? So either you have to be a super user, or you have to give a password and you'll do that, right? And I think the newer Vista is supposed to prompt you for most of these things. Right? How many of you using Vista? Have you used Vista? Okay, few of you, right? So Vista is supposed to prompt you to say, can I get the privileges to install some things? And you may have seen the spoof of it in the Apple ad, right? Um, I thought that's the, the nicest Apple ad they ever did on school, you know, spoofing the Microsoft stuff. But, but essentially, some way you have to elevate yourself, right? And there are other commands. Like if you want to change your password, if you want to change your user, like the name that the system wants to know, know you as, if you want to change your login shell, right? All of them require you to change certain things within the system, right? Because the system is going to use that to log you in, right? So it can't give you all the privileges to go and muck with all the data. So you go through programs like you know, uh, change password or, or, or what have you, that give you just the right privileges to modify something which are, which are important, right? It gives you a little bit of access so you can modify data structures that everybody else's system is also modifying, it is also using. Not enough privileges so I can change anybody else's, right? I shouldn't have enough privileges to change your password, but I need the privileges to change my own password, so I elevate myself through these security programs and, and get these privileges, right? And you run into a lot of problems. I mean, the, the, the reason why Unix went with this, uh, with this two model, right, it may look like a bug because it doesn't let you do certain things, but because it came from Multics, which is kind of the, the father of, father or mother of um, 
the parent of Unix, right? So essentially, there they had a, a ring structure where the, the 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 so you can think of the the privileges as a as a ring structure. The the further in you go, the more privileges you have. So it's not just two levels. You had multiple levels, and you have to enter through something like a trap function or a system call. So that's how you go from one to the other. So you don't jump from one level to another level, wherever you want, except through well-defined um, notions, right? So this is a lot more powerful and a lot more harder for people to comprehend because you could be in one of the levels where you are not super user but not powerful enough kind of thing, right? So they cleaned it up and made it into Unix, but now people complain that Unix is too simple, so you kind of go back and forth, right? So access matrix are the way to d describe what, what we just talked about. So essentially you have a large matrix which define the access privileges. So Sort of, this is what you have, right? Access matrix. Um, so, it, it it specifies for each domain and for each object what privileges you should have, right? So, if you think of domains as, um, you know, you can you can think of the domain as a context of where the program is running, an object as the uh, object you're talking about. So, you can talk about printer, right? And the domain could be a user. So, you can say the printer. For user D2, they have print privileges. The printer for user D3, since there is nothing, by least privileges, they get nothing. So D3 cannot print, right? So this is, in abstract form, this is what you're trying to show. You're saying for all possible objects, for all possible ways of using it, which could be users, programs, or what have you, and for all the possible operations they can have, if there is an entry here, they're allowed. If there's no entry, they're not allowed. Right? So this means that the, the user, if you think of it as user, D4 has access, read and write access to F1, D4 has no access to F2, and, and, and so on and so forth. Right? So this exhaustively describes everything that can happen in the system. And the usefulness of the system depends on you maintaining this stuff accurately. Right? So if you add a new file, right, let's assume you are, you're adding a new file, what should happen? And we will be looking at uh, um, files as the columns, right? Yeah. So you have to define all the read and write privileges for the file for all the. Uh, yeah. First, first you have to make the the matrix larger, right? You have to insert a column, right, and put the file, and yeah, you have to go through so. By least privileges, nobody will get any access. Then you have to go and explicitly mark all the stuff, right? All, all the users who have access, right? The, the, you have to do that every time something is added, right? And you have to have this data structure for the entire operating system. It's not per user, right? Because the user is part of the stuff. So you have to manage, manage this one big matrix, which can potentially grow as you add more files, right? Um, so what happens if you delete a file? Yeah, to remove the column from the matrix, and so potentially this 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 matrix can be pretty large, right? And this matrix is accessed by everything, right? Everything in the system which needs to operate on anything, right? So it may be user, maybe applications, maybe uh, what have you. All the domains need access to any domain which needs access to any object has to access this this matrix, right? So this could be a potentially large matrix. This is a potentially um, vital matrix, right? You cannot let anybody just go and modify these things, right? So you have to define ways of who can modify what, because if I let anyone modify, then the whole purpose goes away, because I can just go and modify to give myself whatever privileges I want, right? So this is abstract, this is what you want to do. It's not practical because it's maintaining such a large structure, large, such a large central one structure. It's not a, um, not a good idea, right? So essentially, um, that, so that's 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 what the access matrix does. So as you notice, you have to have a way of stating that something should be. You you need more privileges than just what, what I can do, right? So I need privileges to add a row, right? In fact, like add a, add a new file. Um, I need a, uh, I need privileges such as um, copy or give somebody else privileges, right? So I need to either be able to give privileges to somebody else, right? 
So which may mean that I'm the owner. So as owner, I ought to be able to give somebody else privileges. Otherwise, some magical person has to enter those entries, right? So you may have a policy that if it's your own file, you can give privileges to others, right? Which goes beyond what you have. So you may only have read access for yourself, but you have this owner privileges so you can give some privileges to others. You can copy whatever privileges you have for a new file that you're creating, right? And other stuff, so, uh, or you can become somebody else, like the sort of the sudo, right? So these kind of operations are needed for the system to be useful. Otherwise, you're kind of stuck with where you are. Otherwise, you're defined to be, uh, so, so I'm, I'm gonna switch over to, the, to this graph to um, explain what, what that means, right? So if I only give you privileges, like sort of when we looked at it before, we only looked at it up, you know, up to the laser printer uh, stuff, right? So that means that the user D2 can only print, but they can't read any files. They can't read any, any of the other objects because they don't have privileges, right? So if you want D2 to be able to access the files, you have to specify all the entries for D2 and that gets messy, right? So one of the bases, you add other fields on the side. You add other capabilities. One of the capabilities may be switch, right? And switch means that you essentially you can switch from one to another. So if you say, so um, D2 can switch to D3, right? Which means that D2 is allowed to do, in, in, in the Unix sense, sudo to D3, right? D2 is not allowed to D, uh, switch to D1. So D2 cannot become uh, D1 but D2 can become D3, right? Um, and same, for example, D1 can become D2, right? So D1 is allowed to read file F1 or F3, right? And then when it wants to print, it's allowed to switch itself to D2, and in D2 it can print, right? But once it's switched, it cannot read those files. So it has to switch back. So if it has a way to switch back to D1, it can continue to read the stuff. Otherwise, you have to prepare all the output, switch to the new user, print it, and that's it. Does that make sense, the switch operation? We do some of those explicitly, right? When you do a printer, you don't actually print to the file, print to the printer, because you don't have the privileges to do a printer. So you have a notion of a print spooler, right? But when you print it, you give the file to the print spooler, and all you're allowed to do is give the file program to the print spooler, and that's it. And all the principal is allowed to do is get the file from you and control the print device, right? When the print, but the principal is not allowed to look into your files. It's, it's, it's only allowed to print whatever you gave it to print, right? And this is conceptually what you're doing. So essentially, you have D1, which is operating on these files, creates this print file, gives it to a spooler, and spooler can print it. It can control the printer device and all those things, but it's not allowed to read any of your files, right? So that's, that's one of the operations you need, because otherwise, you, if you don't give this stuff, you should either let me control the printer, which is not good, or you should let the printer read my files, which is not good either, right? So you need to have this kind of a switch operation. But the, but the thing to notice is, if you add this kind of functionality, then your access matrix becomes bigger and bigger, right? So now you have a extra set of columns for all the switch operations. There are other operations, right? Um, so other operations that I can, I can give to others, right? So if I'm a owner, right, I can copy these rights to somebody else, right? If I have read, read, read star, that means I can give my access rights to somebody else. I can give somebody else read access to my files, right? I, don't, I cannot give somebody else write access, but I can give read access, right? So again, these, are, these would let some of these operations happen. So if I, if in, the, in the case of the printer, I can create a temporary file, and if I have the read star, then I can give the read privileges, I can give my read privileges to the printer domain, right? Um, and, and similarly for, for owner, owner you assume that owner, even if they don't have any access to the file, they can do whatever, right? So if you go to your own uh, Unix files, and if you give, take away all the privileges from yourself, right? If you do a, you know, um, if you do something like for the files, right? This basically states that for the user, you remove read, write, and execute privileges, right? If this happened to anybody else, then they won't be able to access the file, right? But you as a user can go back and say,
which says that I removed myself all privileges and I'm giving myself only read privileges, right? And this can happen because I'm the owner. So even if I, so at this point, I have no access to the file except I'm the owner, right? As the owner, I can give my, get the, the, the privileges back from the system, right? Because the owners are, owners are assumed to be the owner responsible person. So regardless of what privileges you give yourself, you still have privileges beyond what the other stuff do. So if you're as an owner, you may define what they can do. For example, they can, they can create a copy or whatever, even though they themselves may not be able to modify these things, right? Again, the semantics depend on what kind of applications you're, you're talking about. And the, the more powerful they are, the more richer you can describe what is possible and what is not possible, right? And the less powerful they are, you have to have a broad stroke of what is possible. But the, the more powerful it is, then we can potentially control precisely what you're allowed to do, right? So I want to have as much power as possible so I can precisely say the print spooler is only allowed to read this particular file, right? It's not allowed to modify the file. It's not the owner. I'm the owner. I'm going to give the file to the printer, and the printer can do exactly this kind of stuff, right? So the access matrix can be made as complex as you want to define precisely as you want, but the, but the catch is the more complex it becomes, the more and more the matrix becomes bigger. So even, even here, once you start adding these fields, your access matrix gets larger and larger, and each field gets more complicated and complicated. I mean, it's no longer read, it's read star, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And you have to define what those operations are. And for the files, read, write makes sense. For printer, it's printer, you know, print, add to queue, remove from queue, and so on makes sense. For backup, it may be something. So you have to define all these operations in this access matrix. Right? Um, so you may have something like this. You may be able to switch, you may be able to, able to control, and you, you specify this sort of stuff. So I'm going to go back to um, So the, the hard part is now you have this sparse matrix, a really large sparse matrix, which defines for each object, each operation, what you can do, and for each object, for other objects, what you're allowed, for each domain, what other domain, what, you, what you're allowed to do. And, and this tends to become larger. Um, so no operating system actually implements the access matrix, right? So access matrix is the mother of all privileges that you want, right? But it's not implementable because it's so large a data structure. The way you implement that is through access control list, right? Which is what your AFS uses. So you, you might have seen some of some of those stuff. So essentially, you take the, the big matrix, which says that for each domain, um, for each um, object, what these what this stuff are. In the, for the um, capability list, you say for each object, you say what what the entries are, right? So you take it along the column and say for each object, what are the different privileges for each domain, right? So for example, you may say something like for file, right? You can say for user, they have read, write, right? For printer, they have read and so on and so forth, right? So access control list basically states for this particular object, in this particular domain, what privileges they have. This particular domain, what privileges they have, right? And this can be as big as you want. So essentially you're looking at the, um, so for F3, you would say D1 would be read, D3 would be execute, D4 would be read, write. And if you look up, look up domains as users, That'll be user one can uh, read, user three can execute, user four can read and write. So those are the access control list, and that's what your um, your AFS does, right? So if you go to I think this is the path, right? This is the path where the um, AFS stuff is. So if you go to AFS space and if you say, if you go to this particular path and you say list 
Excel, access control list. And if you say dart or whatever file, it, it lists all the access control you, you have, right? And if you look at the file, it will have lots of privileges. So for example, the, the course Dropbox, right? I have a lot more privileges than you, right? So I have, I have privileges to read all the contents that you put in the, in the access, uh, in, the, in the Dropbox. I think you don't have privileges. You have privileges to look at contents that you put there, but not others, right? So in the Dropbox, you cannot see what others have done, right? And you're not allowed to delete the objects either, right? For the AFS Dropbox, for your course projects and stuff, I don't think you're allowed to delete it. You're allowed to create the file, you're allowed to put the file, you're not allowed to see who else has any contents. You're not allowed to delete them either. So you, 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 it's a one-way street, right? So I'm allowed to look at them and do certain stuff. System administrators can do certain other privileges, and the backup program can do certain other stuff, right? So backup program is trusted differently than system administrators, and there are three levels of system administrator. There's the OIT, there's the, um, the courseware, you know, the teaching uh, people, the department system administrator, like Kurt and all those things. So there's a whole bunch of people who look at the content, and depending on what the role is, right? So you have no reason to look at any of your peers' projects, so you have no privileges, right? whether you like it or not. So unless somebody else gives you the privileges, you don't have those. But essentially, you have them as a long list of stuff, right? So it may still be unwieldy, but it's at least implementable, right? So it, it depends on each file. So each object now has to have these privileges. If you have the privileges, you, you can operate on them, right? Um, so essentially, you can um, you can create the you can make a list. Of, you look at the column and figure out what those things are. So now it's it's distributed. Now it's no longer li linked with the on a system basis. It's it's by the object basis. So the printer can say these are the capabilities I have. The the file can say these are the capabilities I have, and and so on and so forth. So what would that mean in terms of um, manageability? Do you think it's, it's, it's more manageable or less manageable? It depends on how you look at it, right? So, so, you, so right now, the system administrator cannot look at the whole system and know what privileges there are, right? System administrator has to look at each object to see what privileges were given out. So there's no central place you can go and say, what privileges do people have for something, right? What privileges does do you have, right? I can't answer that. Because all I know is, for every object, I can see what privileges you have. So if I look at all the files in the system, or all the objects in the system, and try to see what privileges you have, I can rebuild the access matrix, right? But I can't ask the system, I don't think I like this person. What privileges do they have currently? I can't know, right? I can find out if they have access to a particular file, but not all the privileges they have. That is kind of spread out, right? Which means that I can't take privileges from them too, right? So once you graduate and I, I say, I no longer trust you, I want to take the privileges away from you, there's no central place I can go and say, you no longer have privileges. I have to go through all the files to make sure that you don't have some residual privileges, right? So that, that includes, that creates lots of problems. I mean, there's back pointers and stuff. So it, it may so happen that I went through, I deleted a home directory, but you left something in the, uh, in the course project directory where you, you have some privileges left because that particular object, you have privileges. So unless somebody goes and cleans the entire system, you have these things hanging around. So it's not, it's not good, but this is the best we have, right? It's a lot more powerful than what you have for Unix, basically, only group, user, uh, and, and others. You have a lot more stuff, right? So this is some things that you will learn in a system administration class, right? So how, how would you manage these things? How, how would you do the, create these access control lists and manage this stuff, right? From OS perspective, it doesn't matter which one you use. All it knows is it has to look up somewhere to say, if this particular object you're looking at and this domain, let's say user, right? So this particular file, this user wants to uh, access, you look up either the access control list or the access matrix to say if you have access. And if you don't have access, it's OS job to say no, right? So OS does the mechanism, not the policy, right? And I think that's a... <coughs> Yeah, I think uh, somewhere down there I have the slide. So this is called the, 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 the separation of pa policy from mechanism, right? Operating system does not enforce the policy. Operating system enforces the mechanism, right? So if you say you should have read access, you will have read access. If I say you should not have write access, 
you will not have write access. But the operating system does not care how that how you create those those lists, and that's even though operating system would hand wave those stuff. In a real system, those are real concerns, right? And, and people still uh, struggle with those, right? And most of the security threats you talk about when you see on, on the news and stuff are based, some of these are, are, are uh, culprits, right? If as a system administrator, I can't take away privileges from you, then you may have some privileges and do bad stuff, and it's, 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 a, it's a problem, right? And, and there were a couple of stuff which really enforced that, like there's a project called Hydra and a project called Cambridge uh, Cap System, which was in um, late 60s, I think, right? The Cambridge um, Data Capability System, right? Again, the, the OS enforced the capabilities. Uh, compared to them, what AFS implements is pretty rudimentary, right? So can you think of why the AFS model Without going into detail of what operating, uh, AF, AFS can uh, can do, fundamentally, why would uh, AFS model not be as strong as you would want? Can you think of a reason why doing it in a file system may not be everything? I can I didn't give the answer in the question, but <clears throat> the answer is in the the file system, right? AFS only let gives privileges all those things for the file system, right? Not for the entire operating system, right? So if you're running as a program, right? If you access a file, I know what to do, but. I don't have anything about what you do as a system, as a program, as a running program. If you want more memory, right? Again, there's a capability, right? I have to figure out if I should give you more memory, but that's not AFS does not care, right? So, it's it's a pseudo solution. It works for the file system, but not for the operating system itself. And that's what these these systems do, right? <coughs> they will define everything, everything that we looked at as capabilities and define what I can get and what I cannot get, right? And for the most part, the, those are not, those are that undefined. So right now, if you want a thread, I'll give you a thread, right? The system will give you a thread. Whereas in a true system, you have to say, you don't have the capability to get one thread, or maybe like you can't get 10 threads or whatever, right? And these, these were done in like 60s and stuff, right? And it never quite caught on because they were very hard to use, very hard to use, very hard to define, because you need a way to define name stuff, right? For files, it's easy, because files have a name that we all know, but for other objects, it's kind of, you have to have a name, and so you have to define that memory or CPU or, or what have you, and then defining these things are, are very complicated, and this is still an ongoing project, a lot of people still work on trying to solve these issues, um, and in essence, you have to do these things, and without going to do too much detail about like viruses and all those things, right? If you have a capability-based system, then viruses won't be a problem for you, right? Because the viruses cannot acquire, unless they become super user, they cannot acquire the privileges to do anything more than the least privilege, right? But whereas right now, they get a lot more privilege because the file system says you can't read this file or whatever, but you can do a whole bunch of other things. You can read memory or, or what have you. And we'll see a little bit of those uh, in, the, in the following slides, right? So, so, so since it, is, it, it was deemed to be pretty hard to implement all this stuff in, 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 in the operating system itself, one of the ways to implement this is through programming language, right? In a programming language itself, you can say what capabilities that each of the something else should have, right? And those are deemed to be a pretty nice, easy way to use stuff more than telling the operating system. Rather than telling the operating system that you are not allowed to use the printer, I can somehow say this program, this function, this something should not have more access to something else, right? So do you, have you used one of these languages where I can explicitly say what privileges each object should have or shouldn't have? You think? Actually, you have, and that's the Java, right? 
Java essentially does this. So how many of you use uh, capabilities in Java, capability manager in Java? How many of you have heard of capability manager in Java? So in Java, whenever you create a JVM, right, there is one thing sitting underneath all of them and creates an object called capability manager, right? And it instantiates your object and you run, right? You can do this within your own program. So if you look up capability manager, right, uh, the object, when I create a new thread, I can assign it to a new capability manager and I can give it whatever capabilities I want, right? And it's not intuitive, and it's not usually taught in you know, your um, programming classes. But essentially, so the whole logic is this is easier than operating on operating system, right? So, so one has to wonder if none of you have heard of it or used it, right? I don't know how easy it is, right? Um, so essentially, if you think about it, Java operates in three, three different modes, right? So if you're, if you're using it as an applet, right? It defines certain policies, right? It, it defines that anything which comes from the domain where it came from, it's allowed to execute, right? It's not allowed to touch any of the local files, and it's allowed to open certain other connections, right? So if you write if you write applets, you know the, those rules, right? You're, you're allowed to go back to where you came from. You're not allowed to touch any of the files on the local machine, right? And those capabilities are given by the default capability manager for applets, right? And if you run the same applet as a local file, then it has access to your local files, right? And you can define, you can, you can restrict it. I forget what the file is, but if you have a, um, I, I don't know if it's dot capability or something, there's, there's one file you can create on your home directory, and you can make it to look to see what files it should access, right? But essentially, you are running different capability managers, so those capability managers may or may not let you do, depending on what happens, and you're not allowed to modify it from inside yourself. So it has to be a capability that in, you inherit from somebody, right? So let's say this is a capability manager, right? It calls one thread, and you can call another CM, you can call another thread, right? So whatever privileges that this thread will have, will depend on what was given here and what was given here, or what was taken away from here, what was taken away from here, right? And you can't really know what those are because those are, when you try to access those, they'll fail because this will make sure that if you try to access something that you don't have privilege to, it'll fail. Java will make sure that, it will implement the mechanism that if you try to do something that you're not supposed to have, it'll fail, right? But the policies are set by something here and you don't know those stuff, right? So the way you do that in Java is through stack introspection, which is basically you are allowed to look through the stack to see what was inherited, right? So this will put all the capabilities that it has into your stack, right? Going back to the first, like, uh, first couple of lectures, right? When you call a function, every time you call a new function, you push the new function in the stack, right? So this is function one, then you say function two, function three. If this was function one, if it was like this, right? Fun so func if function three was here, right? It came from function two, it came from function one, right? So you're allowed to look back in the stack. You put the privileges in the stack, right? So you can look back to see what privileges I have by looking back in the stack. And if I have the capabilities, then Java will let you go, right? And this is called stack introspection. Basically, you go back in the stack to see what capabilities you have, right? And for this to work, it uses pointers to go back on the stack, right? So fundamentally, Java cannot use pointers, cannot let you use pointers. Because if you use pointers, you can just use the pointer to go back up here and modify the stack, and you have more privileges, right? So unlike C, Java cannot possibly make you operate with pointers, because if it did, then you can go back in the pointer and muck with the capabilities. So the capabilities come to you through, through your stack, and you're not allowed to look in the stack. The system, only the capability manager is allowed to look back in the stack, and not you, right? Um, so, so th that's the state of the art in terms of what, cap what the capabilities you can do, right? 
Um, so you should really look into what Java can do in the capability manager because that's that's fundamentally what Java offers. Right? Java Java is not just a programming language. Java gives this this kind of stuff where it says, if you are interested uh, applet, right? Then you don't have certain privileges. You can't do the stuff, right? You can't read my files. You can't open a connection to anywhere. There's a certain set of uh, stuff, right? And if you're a Java program, you're allowed to do certain stuff, right? And if you're a Java program, there are ways to restrict it from doing stuff. So you can say, I'm running this Java applet. You can look at my directories, my, my files in project directory, but not in another directory, right? All of those implemented through Capability Manager, right? It's a fairly powerful mechanism, and that's that's the reason why you use Java over C++, right? Um, so I, I encourage you to look at that. And um, one one thing to notice: it's not a trivial thing. I mean, it's not. How many of you know Java very well? How many? So this is real Java. I mean, this is like real Java code, right? So if you write a capability manager, um, you should know Java pretty well, right? It's it's not. Uh, um, it's not that friendly, and by definition, capabilities are not that friendly to deal with because you need to know what the right capability is. Because if I don't give the capability to you, your program will fail and be at base. Right? So if you try to open a file, um, open a connection, then it'll fail. You gotta know how to deal with those. Right? So that's pretty much the capability notion. The capability notion is the OS says that it'll it'll take care of making sure that. Um, it, so it, 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 it'll have certain mechanisms, it'll implement those, right? If the, if the operating system is strong, it'll make sure that you will not get more privileges than what you're entitled to, right? If it does, then that's a, that's a bug with the operating system, right? But it does not care anything about the policy, right? Policy is done by somebody else who says what they should be have access to. And if that is violated, then operating system would let you have stuff. So if you have a capability which says that you have privilege to kill any process in the system, right? Operating system will sincerely let you do that, right? So looking back at what Windows XP and all does, right? Without actually going through what precisely Windows XP may be doing in terms of security and all those things. How many of you believe that Windows XP is insecure? And how many of you think that Windows XP is, is secure? without defining exactly what those are, but, you know, just a gut feeling, right? How many of you think that Windows is XP is not very secure operating system? Right? So, how many of you, so thinking about this stuff, right? How many of you believe that Windows XP implements the mechanisms poorly, and how many of you believe that Windows XP implements the mechanisms correctly, but implements the policies poorly? Right? The, first, the first case is it implements the mechanisms poorly. If it implements the mechanisms poorly, it doesn't matter what the policy is because you know, if, if mechanism is poor, you're, you're, you're host anyway. But the second case is the mechanisms are fine, but the policies are all messed up. Right? So in this case, right, if I implement a policy which says you're allowed to open a connection anywhere, then applets are a bad idea because then it can, it can contact anybody else. Right? So the policy is the most important stuff, not the mechanism. Right? So how many of you believe in a gut feeling without proof or anything? Which way is what, right? I don't know the exact answer either because you know Microsoft won't tell us, but I'm saying just just the gut feeling, right? Yeah. Mechanisms are good, but the policies. Yeah, I think I think I think I think that's the that's the I I, think, I believe that's the problem, right? The the mechanisms are good, but the policies are bad. Can you guess why that may be the case? Yeah. They just want to make it convenient for the everyday user. Yeah, that's the one problem with all the security and all the capability system, which is convenience, right? If I really exactly do the right policy, I should be able to say, you should have access to this classroom from, um, uh, you should have access to Debartlow from, you know, 11, 4, 10, 40 to 11.30, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? That's, that's the exact religious I should be able to give you, right? And if I somehow implement that, that right? If I somehow say that you are only allowed to go to Debartlow from exactly the, maybe five minutes here, my five minutes here, there, and if you stay anymore, I'm gonna start shooting you kind of thing, right? No, I mean, it's a, 
the equivalent in here would be like evict you or kill you, right? In the in the process domain, right? If you were to do that exact stuff, right? It's so annoying because then it becomes like you know you're like, but if what if I have to ask a question for a few more minutes, right? Then I have to give you an exception. I, I have to say, well maybe you can stay for extra half an hour, right? But what the policy right now they have is maybe you can stay till evening six o'clock or seven o'clock, right? Because it's it's sort of convenient. So the convenience factor and the security factor is always a tug of war, right? If you make it extremely secure, extremely accurate, mechanisms don't matter, but the policies, if they're extremely secure, then my grandma cannot use Windows XP, right? Because it says you can't do that stuff. I mean, you're only allowed to do certain stuff. So Microsoft chooses to make it more convenient, which means that it's less secure, right? It's not, not exactly only a policy for Microsoft. It's also true for Mac and all those things, right? And again, I'm not saying that there's no room for uh, improvement and all those things, but essentially that's a fundamental uh, dichotomy that you have to get through, which is, do you want, you want security, but at the same time, you don't want to deal with insecure stuff, right? Um, so for example, if, you, if you're thinking of like passwords, right? You, we all know that the real password should be pretty complicated for no one to remember, including yourself. It should be changed every day, all those things, right? <laughs> but we don't do those, right? Because it's, I mean, we are human, and security has to deal with those. It can't say, we want to be secure, we'll, not, we'll ignore the users. Because if we ignore users, it'll become something like Windows XP. How do you manage those? That's the hardest part, right? Implementing mechanisms is easy. Implementing the right policies, which are useful to the user, is hard. But people blame Windows XP. People don't exactly say, uh, the mechanisms are fine because mechanisms are built on solid foundation, but the policies that Microsoft is implementing is, is wrong. People think that Microsoft operating system is um, insecure, right? So that, that's why it becomes operating system issue. Even though technically it's not operating system issue, it's, a, it's somebody else's issue, and we don't know who that is, right? So I'll, I'll go through the security component a uh, little bit on, on Monday, right? But security is a lot more belongs a separate class than 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 the uh, protection and stuff so take the